Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, both as a group and as solo artists, past, present, things to come. We have a little of everything this week, I think. Um, I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hello there, Alan. And hi, everyone. And Steve Marinucci, the world's last remaining full-time Beatles reporter, whose work you see in Variety.com, Billboard.com, Goldmine, Access.com, and all kinds of other places. Hello, Steve. Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Okay. And today we're going to talk about uh, Paul McCartney's Driving Rain album um, in sort of an installment in our regular series of looking at each of the solo albums and e- and group albums uh, as we sort of go along. And um, first, though, we have a number of news items, starting with a couple of books coming out. Steve, do you want to fill us yeah, in? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll take that. There, uh, Ringo announced this week he's got another new book uh, with Genesis coming out called Another Day in the Life. It'll have more photographs that he has taken in the past uh, that we haven't seen, like he did with the photographs book. And it's the same kind of, you know, chronicle of his uh, life, um, you know, that he did with um, the postcards uh, book. So uh, this will come out in the fall and it will be expensive. He did not say if there's going to be a a cheaper edition. version. Yeah, mm-hmm. trade edition. I sure hope mm-hmm. so. And I think a lot of people hope so because a lot of people can't afford to get those Genesis books. But uh, I hope he does. Um, but we will see. So what do we and expect then, oh, of this one? I mean, Well, the same, I think the same thing is the same things as in the past where he has photos of the of the group that he has taken that we haven't seen in photo, photos of himself. Maybe uh, he, he had some early photos of himself uh, in the, in uh, photographs uh, that uh, we hadn't seen. And, so should we, yeah. we assume that he has used the primo stuff in the first couple and that this will be less primo, or do you think that he had a long-term idea of putting out a series of books and that he saved some of the good ones for now? I, I that's a good question. I, I I don't know. I hope these are these are just as good. I hope these are just as good. It doesn't we, make any sense to put all the best ones in the first book. <laughs> you know, I think he'd spread it out over however many he wants to put out. Mm-hmm. That's if he knows in advance that he's going to do a bunch. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. But I, mean, if you looked at- I kind of wish he'd put out a book that was a book, you know, um, his his memoirs fundamentally, even if he does it with a writer, you know, um, I, I'd be very <laughs> interested in hearing his perspective. I, I, I love photos, but I kind of would like to hear what his memories are specifically and in long form. When he has talked about it, the few times that he has, he's been you know, really eloquent. And, but apparently from what we've heard, he doesn't want to do that, which is really a shame. I mean, he's done, he's done it in song. He's done it, you know, this way with the photographs, but apparently he doesn't want to sit down and, and do that kind of thing. And it's too bad. Uh, He really, he really should. Uh, I think he would, it would be very interesting to hear what he has to say. Yeah. Well, but, he did say the main reason why he doesn't want to put out his memoirs is because all anybody will ask him about is about those seven years, and he'd want to talk about more than that. Right, but well, I think, I think Mark Lewison proved that that's not true um, by going into great detail about his early life, and and um, I, I don't know, I, I'd be interested in reading the whole thing, uh, wouldn't you? Yeah, oh, and, yeah. And, and we had we had you know he did the uh, the Grammy Museum exhibit, which was not just the seven years, yeah. and that was very interesting. I you know I was lucky enough to see that. It was it was a lot of fun seeing all that stuff that was there. So he, I think there would be a a big interest in that, and it's 
it's too bad that he doesn't go that route. I mean, he could also he would probably also want to talk about the All Star Band too, which is fine, you know. But it, I wish he would do that. I wish he would decide that it would be worth our attention. And apparently, he's not going to. So, well, I'm just saying that this is how Ring, what Ringo feels in his own mind. Right. That that's all the public or any uh, a book publisher would be interested in is mainly about the Beatle years. And he'd want to talk about more than that. I don't. I don't think so. I think with when you're talking about somebody in the Beatles, they're going to take the book, no matter what it is, um, pretty much. I mean, I don't think they're going to differentiate. They're not going to differentiate that much. And if Ringo wants to talk about the Beatles for, you know, a portion of the book and the rest of his life for more of the book, I think they'll take it because they know there's an audience out there that will buy it. So. I, I I don't see that at all. Okay. But well, I hope I hope he does. Ringo has said. I this hope he did. Ringo I, was, yeah, yeah well, that is that is that is what he said, and uh, you know, I, we I think we're just disagreeing with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, he feels better telling his story in song, and yeah, so seemingly. he's been doing it. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, and in photo From albums out. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 And so there was something else in the book department too, wasn't there, Steve? There's a, a Lennon Imagine book, and that the news about that has been out for a while. Yoko's posted about it, um, that there's going to be a new book, a large book, a coffee table book on the making of Imagine. And um, that's going to have a bunch of archival pictures and things. And that's supposed to be, I guess, probably around the time of John's birthday in October. Yep, uh, October 9th. Yep. So, so is that when the reissue the of the album itself is coming out too? Because uh, it dovetails nicely with that. I mean, I, I think they, I think they'll probably be around. The, I'm, I'm not positive, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were around the same time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Yoko is into, uh, you know, releasing yeah. stuff on John's birthday. Right. So that would be the time. That would be. That and, would be. And that gives buyers a month or so, maybe a month and a half to recover before they have to shell out once again for the, what we hope is huge, white album 50th anniversary release. Right. But they're all... Uh, that, that should be in November, theoretically. Right. And, but they're also... It looks like there will also be something else this year, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, the other thing we have to talk about... <laughs> Oh, well, the other... yes. <laughs> okay, well then, well, speaking of that, mm-hmm. are we spe- up to speaking of that yet? Yes, I Obviously, think we are. Obviously, the, the, the big news this weekend was all of the sort of tumult surrounding Paul's visit to Liverpool, which no one apparently knew about uh, in advance, and, uh, you know, must have been fairly exciting for the people on the ground, but Steve... Wrote about that for Variety dot com and uh, also for Billboard. I wrote for, wrote about it for Billboard too, actually. But not, right. yeah, the Billboard story was the earlier story right after it happened. But the Variety story picked up the uh, interview with Jackie Spencer, who who was awesome uh, mm-hmm. to talk to me. And we also had I also got some other details. Uh, a few more details had surfaced by that time, and so they were they were all in that story. Okay, so, so well, why don't you pick up with uh, you know your chat with Jackie and um, whatever you want to tell us about what you've turned up about this trip? Well, what we uh, I got a hold of Jackie and I asked her if she'd mind talking about what exactly happened, and uh, we connected and we, we did a say who Jackie sure. is for the listeners. Jackie, Spen- Jackie Spencer is a Liverpool tour guide. She works, uh, her website is beetle, www.beetleguide.com. And she, she does daily tours, uh, in Liverpool of, uh, uh, beetle sites. And she, she's told me stuff before. I remember when the strawberry fields gate was vandalized. She told me about that. And I wrote about that, uh, uh, a few years ago. She was also but, really helpful when we were doing Alan Williams a bit too, right? You know? Yes, I believe I believe she was. Yeah, she yes. confirmed that it was in Liverpool, all that stuff. So right, she, she's, she's a very always, good source. We like her. She's <laughs> yes, we, very good, very good source. And if you're looking to get a tour of Liverpool, go go see Jackie. 
but uh, in any event, um, I, I got a hold of her, and she was gracious enough to talk to me for a few minutes. She said she, uh, I believe she said she had just gotten off a tour, and she was really tired. And if you remember, this is there's an eight hour difference between where I am in California and where she is in Liverpool, so it was late in the day. But she talked to me anyway, and we talked about what had happened. And um, I apologize for the technical issues with this tape. Um, we had we had some problems with it but i think you'll be able to hear what she says so here we go when everybody heard about this they they were all going crazy and you were you were the first one to see it what happened you were you were on the tour so i was finishing a tour i had four people with me so i'm from washington state i'm from california we had a lovely morning and we finished the tour by the new statues at the pier head and then um, there was a couple of paparazzi around and we said to one of them who's the celebrity in town because we'd heard rumors but nobody would tell us and then this guy said well i'll tell you one of them it's james corden so i was like okay fine not that bothered he said but he's with somebody else and they're in that car over there and the next minute this black car pulls up and both Paul McCartney and James Corden get out of the car, which I've seen Paul in Liverpool before, but this was a shock because we didn't know he was here. And he just walked over to us as we were taking the pictures, about 30, 40 people around maybe. And he just stood and got pictures with everybody at the statue, stood by himself and don't think he's seen himself at the statue before, pointing up at himself. <laughs> just being really nice to everybody, he was bringing people in so they could get pictures with him him and james corden were taking selfies then just walked back got in the car and disappeared off and went around liverpool and it was fabulous he normally when he comes to town for lipa everybody knows about that right for the liver Usually we know the date yeah we know the date of the lipa graduation so <laughs> we know we're likely to bump into him but this time was completely out of the blue but of course after that everybody knew he was in town so he ended up at Penny Lane at Fourth Lynn Road, and then he played a gig at the Philharmonic uh, Philharmonic Pub. Somebody told me that he had not he uh, at the visit at Fourth Lynn Road he went in, and he normally he did. yeah that's what that's what I was told. You don't know that for sure. I know. No, I know for sure. I've just been chatting to Linda. I've just finished a tour now, and Linda came out and was telling us that yeah he went in the house for the first time as far as I know. And he um, he played when I'm 64 on the piano. Oh, we really? in the house. Oh my, that's that's great. Yeah, because somebody said uh, somebody said that he hadn't been in the house for for decades. He, no, he's always he's always turned up and there's been nobody there. They've not let him in, or you know, for various reasons he's not gone inside. And this time he did to do the show with James. So um, it was quite um, quite a special day, quite a shocking day in some ways, but in a nice way. Wow, wow! And then he went to he went to uh, besides that he he and James uh, took pictures at uh, Penny Lane, yeah, and the in the middle of the round. Of shall, right, right. And then they they went to the Philharmonic where he did several songs, including apparently one new one, according to the video that's floating around this morning. So okay. yeah. <laughs> Well, I was too. I I was working on other tours then, so I had three tours yesterday. Mm-hmm. Each time we went past the Philharmonic, we knew he was there. So, funnily enough, my third tour was a coach group for um, Trafalgar Tours, and they were supposed to be having dinner in the Philharmonic, and the Philharmonic called them and said they were going to be late because Paul McCartney was playing again. <laughs> So my tour group like, said they should have insisted and gone at the right time. <laughs> they were polite and they turned up just after the gig. Yeah. Okay. Wow. What a what a day. What a day. Jackie, thank you. What I, you don't think is he still around? Do you, as far as you know, or do, or do you expect to see him today? He's not been spotted. We don't think he went home last night, but we don't know. So we haven't seen him around town. Maybe he's just having a nice spa day or something. I don't know. He deserves it. Right. Right. Thank you very much for taking the time, Jackie. I really appreciate this. You're welcome. Okay. As Jackie said, they first turned up at the statue, and they also went over to Penny Lane, and he went to the, they went to the shelter in the roundabout. They got a picture of them there. He put his autograph on one of the Penny Lane signs, uh, and Ooh. and they went over to and they went to Fourthland Road where he went in the house, and apparent from what 
she told me and from what others have said, it was the first time in over 50 years he had been in the house. He'd never been able to go in the house previously. I thought it was interesting the way she put it because she said, you know, yeah. when he's turned up there, you know, sometimes they wouldn't let him in. What is that? Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> I, 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 that, 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 uh, that's, that's interesting. I think probably what she meant was that they, they there was just nobody there. But, uh, yeah, I really doubt that they would have kept him out. Um, but in any event, and then they went to Philharmonic Hall and the, the, pub the group on a call not the Phil right on a call Phil right Monica. right <laughs> right and they played now what was interesting about that and i didn't mention this in the story was brian ray had had posted on twitter i believe a couple of days before or on facebook a picture from an airplane and he said something like you know here we go and people were going where are you going, Brian? And of course, <laughs> Brian did not say anything. And it was, you know, you kind of thought at the time something's up. And indeed it was. And Brian and the band, and there, there was one picture I saw of Wix, but the, the whole band was there, mm -hmm. um, played in that little show. They apparently played for about an hour. Um, the songs include, uh, I saw different track uh, or different song listings, and the one. I saw on Setlist FM did not have the new song, which we have the video of. So I'm not sure exactly what they played, to be sure. But they did play a new song that I liked. I liked a lot. It's a, a rock and roll song. and We don't know um, the name of it. No, we don't. It, he kept singing something like Come On Home or something like that. So I don't. we don't know what the name of it is, though. So but actually, like that, I'll come home with you. You come home with me. That, right. Or something. That, yeah. Something, something like that. that. But we don't, yeah, we don't know. We don't know what it what the title is. And so unfortunately, but this all leads up to the fooling around with his tweet with his uh, profile picture on Twitter and the Twitter picture today of the recording microphones. Something's in the works, as you know. Paul's played this little get social media game before, where he'll hint at stuff, and they won't tell you. So it looks like something is up. Now there's two theories here. One is, and the recording microphones would seem to bear this out, is that they're about to announce the new album, especially and especially with the new song. That seems very likely. The other one, though, is that the drawing that he put out on Twitter almost matches the logo for the tracks Darlington music festival. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's really, really close and it's a small, apparently from what I'm, from what people have been saying, it's a small festival. And, you know, if McCartney is playing, obviously it would be a boost for them. So it's either one, I would guess it's either one of the two. It's either the album or the festival or God knows it could be both, but mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. Uh, no, nobody's nobody knows it. we're it, we're just we're all guessing and, and that's the, the game that's what McCartney wants to do by the time you know by the time the show is out we may all know right so that's I thought it was interesting for him to put uh, well I mean obviously he didn't put the the, the song on uh, YouTube people who were sitting there did it but I think it's interesting that he played a song that nobody had heard it, it uh, must have been sort of a treat sitting there you know first mm -hmm. of all not knowing necessarily that you're going to get a Paul McCartney concert but then getting something that you know you just haven't heard before um, I you know I honestly think that that was very intentional on his part because he figured that somebody would likely mm -hmm. record it and he knew where the speculation would go. He's very good at using social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very easy for him to use social media being the public person and the popular person he is. So I have, you know, I think it was completely intentional. He knew what what they would be getting. Mm -hmm. And they, they they lap it up as you I mean, Alan, you can I think you can justify I mean, you can you know that from dealing with his publicists that they love that kind of publicity. So I really, I really think that this was very intentional, but I, again, I can only guess what's going on and it's, he loves, he loves to put out information piecemeal. Right. You know, mm -hmm. To leave you guessing. Right. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing. James Corden is one lucky dude. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's not only the fact that he's with Paul McCartney, but he's going to all these historic sites with him. Yeah. 
to his childhood home. I mean, how many people are privileged enough to do that? And um, I want to know whose idea <laughs> that was. But I probably was Corden. I mean, I would guess it was Corden's uh, idea. So, Steve, you so, didn't say um, why Corden was doing this and when we will be able to see the results. I did. I did not. Uh, Corden, as as probably everybody, but almost uh, almost everybody but me, knew before this happened. He uh, is involved with something called carpool karaoke, and I confirmed this morning that that's indeed what it's all about. And it's supposed to air next week, which will be actually for the people listening to this show. The first week it's up will be the within the first week the show is online. So there we go. So mm. I, there was one other thing, a uh, newsy thing I wanted to just very briefly mention was that. I got to see the um, Mike and Mickey show uh, with uh, Mickey Dolenz and Mike Nesmith. And it's not going to be uh, – I think it's only like 18 sh shows around the country. If it comes near you, go and see it. You will love it. Uh, the night I went, it was very cold, but it was still a wonderful show. They did some great songs, some songs that uh, they pulled out of – you know, they some very deep tracks. But it was a beautiful show. It really was. So – Enough of that. Okay. I also wanted to mention when um, what Jackie had said in the interview about Paul visiting Fourthland Road, it was interesting that he played When I'm 64, which must have been a nice treat mm -hmm. for anyone that got to witness that. And it's also interesting about what she said about Paul trying to get into the home, and usually there's nobody there. I could see Paul on the spur of the moment going to the house unannounced. In that case, probably – there will be moments when nobody will be home. So it sh shouldn't be all that shocking. I don't think that Paul's the type to, he wouldn't want people to know in advance that he'd be going there. So, um, yeah, so that didn't surprise me about what Jackie said about that. Mm -hmm. But um, what do you guys think of the new song? You know? Oh, I, li I love the new song. I think it's, I think it's great. Uh, I think it's great. I'm looking at it, by the way, speaking of, more things. I'm looking right now at a picture of Paul in a Penny Lane flower shop singing Penny Lane with the owners. <laughs> huh. I'm gonna I'm gonna post it on my on my uh, Beatles group right right as we're talking here. But yeah, there's another new picture of of Paul floating around. I mean, all these pictures that are floating around are are just fantastic. Uh, but anyway, but oh, I thought the song was great, and even even in the 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 lousy quality it was, which it wasn't great. I thought it was fantastic. I, I, I got, and I don't normally get really excited about things like that, but that one was just straightforward enough and, you know, typical, I don't know. I didn't say typical Beatles, Beatles type or something, but I think it was a great song and I, I'm, I can't wait to hear the studio version. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, we I only got that, about two minutes of it. Good, Alan. Yeah, we only got two minutes of it, and it was a little distorted. You couldn't understand all the lyrics, and um, yeah, it it sounded to me maybe kind of promising, but I think I would sort of withhold uh, an opinion until I've heard the finished studio version of it. Yeah, me do, too. Do we think that the the tenor of that song holds? Um, the possibility of what the album may be like, I mean, as a very straightforward rocker album or what, or, or do you want well, to go that it, far? It's hard to say because I mean, here he is in a pub with his touring band playing it, but you know, f as far as we know, it could be fully orchestrated and all kinds of other stuff. We just have no idea what the studio sound is like. You know, oh, that's true. Just, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So, Paul is known for being so eclectic musically. You can't judge on one song. Right. So, and right. we only got like the verses. We didn't even hear, I'm sure there must be a middle section to the song or something. Yeah, it was so, about to go into that right when it, when it cuts out yeah. on the video. Unfortunately, there's been several, there's, there have been a couple of different versions, but I haven't heard of, I haven't heard a longer version of that song so far. So The longest one I've heard is 2 minutes 33. Yeah, and that includes a long spoken intro, um, and it ends at the same place as the other ones I've heard, which 
have been shorter, but mainly because they cut out the, the spoken intro. I think there's only one version, and I think a lot of people have kind of taken it and done stuff to it. Uh, but yeah, so um, unfortunately, maybe somebody's sitting on one. Hopefully, hopefully that's the case. Mm-hmm. We shall see. Okay. Mm. All right. So shall we turn our attention to Driving Rain, gentlemen? Let's do sure. it. Okay. I have to say, at first, it's um, not one of my favorite Paul McCartney albums. And I think that there may be a reason for that. I mean, apart from not particularly liking a lot of the songs, I, I kind of feel that this was a really difficult period for him. You know, it was like right in the heart of the Heather period. And I have a feeling that by the time he recorded some of this stuff, he already had buyer's remorse, so to speak. And, uh, you know, that was a very, even before they were married, I mean, I remember all the reports, it was a very tempestuous relationship. And I just kind of feel that this album, in a way, is a document of what was kind of an unhappy time for him. I mean, it doesn't necessarily show through the songs the unhappiness overtly. I mean, it's it's as, as cheerful as any other McCartney album. And he has a song called Heather on it. Um, mm-hmm. But um, I, that's sort of the the best reason I can think of about, you know, why for me... There just is something about this album that uh, it just seems like bad atmosphere or karma or something. Hmm. That's that's you? interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. So well, maybe You're, I thought can't. if you have um, the two of you have general comments about it before mm. we look at specific songs. Um, yeah, Ken, start with you. Well, this is one of the few McCartney albums that took quite a while to grow on me. Mm-hmm. I found it to be inconsistent in the very beginning but i've grown to love just about every single song it's just that i don't think that the songs flow that well as far as you know paul is is not only a master at coming up with great material but i do think that his songs seg very well on his albums and i think he puts a lot of thought into that this album sounds like a whole bunch of songs thrown together like patched together even though i like the songs there are many times when I feel like cherry picking certain songs from this album that I really want to hear. And it's great when I do that because, you know, I do like practically all the songs on the album. But to sit through the entire album in one long stretch, it doesn't work as well. It just doesn't flow as well. But yet the material, I think, is is really all over the place. Mm-hmm. Most of all, I think, you know, I like his experimental stuff the most. Mm hmm like spinning on an axis, for example, okay. something that's not typical McCartney. But we'll, we'll get more specific as we go along. Okay. And Steve, what's your general impression? I think inconsistent is a good description. In putting, I mean, he said at the time that what they basically did was they went in without any preparation. He brought the songs in and, th- and kind of threw them at everybody and said, here they are, let's do it. And you can kind of tell the way the, some of the songs are um, done, that that's exactly what they did. They, they really didn't sound ready in some respects. Um, I think some of the songs are good. On the other hand, I think some of the songs are, are, are not so good. I think they suffer from uh, an, experiment, an experiment gone bad. I think he tried to do a little too much. And he didn't rein himself in probably enough. I mean, there are some really good songs on there, but at the same time, you know, there's a couple of what I would call really, really embarrassing songs that just make me kind of, you know, grimace. But, I mean, he, it is what it is. It, it isn't one of my favorite albums either. But I will say that after listening to it, after having to sit through it, uh, you know, and to talk about it, I feel slightly better about it, but not it's not going to go down as far as uh, I'm not going to call it a masterpiece as far as a McCartney album goes. Okay. Mm. What songs do you, do you feel are really, what was the word you used? Embarrassing or the worst? Embarrassing. Ones on the, yeah. Uh, uh, she's given up talking. Mm. Uh, I thought that was the, the Dickie bird. I thought, and the, and the yap, yap, yap. That just, you know, you listen to that and you go, yikes. 
and then and then after that driving rain right after it which i which i think is probably one of the worst title songs of uh, you know song uh, uh, title songs or songs that mccartney named a cd after in his in his legacy i thought that was just uh, i mean why he i mean i like the title but the song itself is just just really bad just yeah. really terrible i agree with you there but i don't i don't but well, yeah, see, to me, to me, this is the epitome of lazy songwriting to to count. Um, and when he did it in All Together Now, well, okay, it was cute and fine. But having and done it a, once, that, I don't... that was that was kind of a child song, yeah. really. Where this isn't. Yeah, you know? and also having done it once, I mean, one, two, three, four, five, let's go for a drive, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, it, it, it's kind of like why come up with an actual line when you can count. And that bothers me, you know? I mean, it's okay, his lyrics were, they vary, some of them are very good and some of them aren't, but this is, this just seems lazy to me. I mean, he 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 kind of went to the same thing with Queenie Eye, with O U T spells out. But that had a little bit more, that had a little bo- bit more meaning to it because of what the song was about. Mm-hmm. But there really right. was no reason to do that here, you know. For there there really wasn't a reason, and I mean, and, and that's not the only song, you know. I mean, th- that those two aren't the only songs that are that way on this album. I mean, there's, you know, it's not just those two. And, and, you know, some of them, again, you know, there are, there are a few good songs in here, but there are some that are just, you know, are really hard to listen to. Mm. And that, and those two are, are two of them. So. Okay. Well, I don't have a problem with either of them. (laughs) Okay. uh, No, don't say it like that. Like, like you're surprised. Or you're not surprised. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. But <laughs> well, I like when Paul does things that are a little out of character for him. Okay. I'm not crazy about she's given up talking, but it has a nice edge to it. I don't like when he plays around with his vocals to the point where it's it goes to that filter sound. Mm-hmm. I'm not crazy about that. I like the the lead guitar work that's in there. There's some nice lead guitars, uh, lead guitar work in that song. But Driving Rain is catchy as hell and. I just don't understand why one, two, three, four, can I have a little more is okay. I mean, it's just the same thing. And if anything, it's not a it's not a lazy song because I think that the chord progressions are very interesting. The song doesn't go in the in the direction that you think it's gonna go. So I do like the song for that reason. I do like catchy songs. Even if you think the lyrics might be weak. Yeah. I think maybe if he did this one first, then um, all together now, I would feel the same about all together now. It's like you can get away with this once, you can't get away with it twice. Uh, you shouldn't just get away with it just because it was a Beatles song. You well, know? that's what it, what I said is if it was in the opposite yeah. direction, if the Beatles. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, okay, uh, I'm not thinking of it as being a Beatles song versus a McCartney song as so much as okay, you do this the first time you get a pass, you do it the second time. Let's say he didn't do All Together Now with the Beatles, but he did this early in his solo career and then did All Together Now. This is what I'm saying is, how many times can you do a song that involves counting and not have people say, you know, that's a little lazy? An interesting I don't know. Thing. Two, yeah. two times yeah. in an entire career, that's a lot? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Because it stands out like a sore thumb. I mean, it's counting. It's not a line of lyrics. It's a line of numbers. Okay. You know, and I, I mean, if he was Stephen Hawking, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's interesting. Actually, I'm, I'm looking at my notes um, that I took while listening to it this time. And actually, in uh, seeing it in front of me on the page like this, um, I'm seeing it a little differently than when I was actually listening. Because for a lot of these songs, it's really mostly the lyrics that I don't like, but I like the music. Um, Mm -hmm. Even She's Given Up Talking, I've got, you know, you know, nice instrumental work, uh, lyrics, weak. And and quite a few. And and things like, uh, you know, like you said, Ken, the experimental stuff. I like Rinse the Raindrops. I mean, that goes on for over 10 minutes, and it's a little jammy. But it's, 
you know, it's got a lot of interesting ideas unfolding in those 10 minutes. And quite a number of these, you know, uh, spinning on Naxos, um, sort of like the sort of up-to-dateness of the sound of it. Um, let's see, Your Way, I like the pedal steel. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of there's there's a lot of instrumental stuff and purely musical stuff that I like on this. Um, I just don't feel that the lyrics hold up as well as uh, on a lot of on some of his other albums, and you know, just generally that 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 to me lyrics I guess are you know important to me, and um, and here you know, way too many times I'm thinking mm, not good. Can you think? You think that that uh, uh, she's given up talking and, and uh, driving rain are are catchy and not I mean, you don't see them as you don't sit there and grimace when you hear uh, those songs. Not at all. Driving rain is an extremely catchy song. I was very happy that he did it live when he toured. She's given up talking is also catchy. She's given up talking reminds me a lot of like talk more talk. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the same thing. A lot of people who don't care for press to play because of the electronic sounds of the time, they're probably not going to care for it. She's given up talking or spinning on an axis or those songs. So um, but I like she's given up talking. I'm not absolutely crazy about it. I like the sound of the record. And when a melody sticks in my head and McCartney has that incredible gift where after a few listens, it's stuck there. You know, mm-hmm. regardless of what the lyrics are saying, I can't get it out of my head. See, so, I, can, um, I can I can handle press to play better than I can handle. She's given up talking. Uh, I, I mean, I, I actually like press to play the song better than this. Uh, you I'm mean the press, song press? I'm sorry, press. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I not like, talk I, more talk like I was just saying. Talk more talk isn't bad either. Not, not but she's given up talking. Just doesn't make it. Uh, uh, you know, as as well as either of those two, mm-hmm. um, I can I can listen to those more than I can listen to this. So, and I mean, there's other there's other I mean, there's a few others there's others I like too. I mean, I I'm looking down my notes here. A tiny bubble um, sounds sounded unfinished to me. I wish he had played around with that one a little more. I did I did like Magic. Uh, I I I thought that was a great song. Um, there's a, a nice sentiment in there because it's about when he met Linda, right? Spinning on an axis reminded me of kisses to the bo- kisses on the bottom. Because How the, the vocal, <laughs> the way he the, the way he uh, throated the vocal on that one. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, your love. I loved your love and flame. I, that's without question. I thought that was a wonderful song, a beautiful song. Back in the sunshine, which he, uh, which he, uh, James helped him with, mm-hmm. um, that was that was good. I like that one. Yeah, riding into Jaipur, eh, the rhythms were just a little too odd for me, um, and that apparently is where Jaipur is apparently where Paul bought his engagement ring for Heather. So, but um, I, I didn't particularly care for that one either. They're just uh, the album just. I don't know. It just doesn't stick. Uh, there's there's some there's a few good things. There's a lot of things that just don't hold, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, and then there's um, freedom. Yeah, we haven't mentioned, we haven't talked about freedom yet, have we? No. So freedom was, if I recall correctly, you know, the album was finished, and I think it had even been pressed. Um, mm-hmm. And then nine eleven happened, and he wrote his response, and tacked it on to the end of the album it doesn't appear in the track listing uh it's almost like a bonus track and a single Uh, to me it's it's if i had a hammer i don't know the section (laughs) if if i had a hammer that is talking about love between you brothers that 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 somehow seems so close to what paul is doing in the song now granted he probably wanted a sing-along which if I had a hammer is too. And, you know, it's interesting that he had that response and felt so strongly about it that he wanted to get it on the album. Just seems to me to be not, not at all a top drawer McCartney song or top three or four drawers. Mm. 
The thing about freedom to me is that the chorus is wonderful. It's very easy to sing. The only problem I ever had with freedom is that it really sounded rushed. And I think that he only had a couple of verses in there. Mm-hmm. If he'd have stuck a third verse or a fourth verse, it would have been you know, a much better song. It just sounded like you know, a lot of people complain about him that so many of the songs sounds like you know, he slapped it together in a few minutes. This song sounds like one of those songs. It still works on this level. I just wish that he had written a few more verses, that's all. Maybe he could have counted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I think it worked. It worked fine in the in the in the concert for New York, but outside of the context of that, it just it doesn't. Especially now, it sounds da- very dated, and uh, it, you know it's too bad. Um, I mean, it would. I think it would have been better off put out as just a single and let it go with that rather than stick it on an album. Um, because it's you know nobody it it's not one of those songs you even think about with him anymore. I do once in a while when nine eleven comes around. I think okay. about that song. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I play it on my show around the time of nine eleven. Okay. All right. Well, I you know it hasn't become I think one of McCartney's more memorable songs, and I think there's a, a good reason why. Is well, it here on Pure McCartney. No. Ooh. <laughs> I'm just curious because I don't really have the track listing of that memorized, you know. So, Is it? It's not on the. It's not on the four disc set either. Nope. Well. <laughs> yeah, I. There's I, a I, lot of great songs that are not on on Pure McCartney. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm fine with it not being on there because when you're dealing with someone that's put out 30 albums, there's so much to plow through. Right. Okay, and I we think, all you know, have. We haven't opinions. mentioned on the other end of the album, "Lonely Road." I, I thought that was a, a reasonably good song, a good opener for the album. It had a good sound. I I, I did too. I thought that that was a a really nice song. In fact, I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more attention than it has because it is really a nice song. Yeah. It's a really a great rocker, and it really builds. And I especially like that towards the end. A trick that's done a lot in in music is as a song builds, uh, the person singing it sings it an octave higher. Mm -hmm. So you actually got Paul harmonizing with himself, and his his voice is just so wonderful. It's that very um, gutsy, edgy vocal of his that works really well. And I loved when he when he toured and did this song, and people Mm -hmm. in the audience held up signs. I hear your music, and it's driving me wild. Hmm. It's it's what I wish that he would bring back because it's a great live song to do. Mm-hmm. Also, from a lover to a friend is probably the only song on this album that I had any major difficulty with, hmm. only because of the fact that um, I love the verses and I love the chorus. It's simple and it sticks in your head, but all the la las in there, yeah, didn't really. <laughs> it just didn't work in in this in this context. The falsetto, you know? the falsetto thing to me didn't work either. It, it, it just, um, I sort of cringed all the way through it. And I, even realizing he released it as a single, there are different mixes of it out there. Uh, <laughs> it just, I don't know. I remember when the album came out, Paul said that the reason why this was the single is because Ringo liked it. Huh. He told him that. <laughs> so I guess he went by Ringo's judgment. But, um, it's tough, you know. You're dealing at a time when, you know, you could say it's the single, but radio wasn't playing his music that much, and he certainly wasn't being played on Top 40 radio, so it doesn't really matter all that much what's chosen as the single if it's not going to get airplay anyway. But if you're looking for something that was more contemporary-sounding, um, I would have went with something like Tiny Bubble or Spinning on an Axis. But Lonely Road would certainly work on rock stations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm yeah, really surprised. Definitely. Really surprised he didn't do anything with that. Really surprised. It's well, kind of... he did make a video for Lonely Road, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but I never heard it on the radio mm-hmm. when the album came out. And also, the song I Do is one of the few cases where I would say it's a predictable melody <laughs> from Paul. Um, it's so simple, and yet it works just the way it is. It's just a really nice love song. It sounds um, to me like it's something that could have come from the tug of war pipes of peace era. 
Mm-hmm. It just has that Maybe. kind of melody and, and uh, you know, I'm not saying it definitely does. It just sounds that way to me. Yeah. No, I like it. I, the melody is really nice. Yeah. it's. Uh, I played I Will and I Do back to back on my radio show last week and it sounded so good together. Mm-hmm. Two ballads from Paul like that. <laughs> um, a Tiny Bubble has got a really nice groove to it. The thing is, I remember when this album first came out, a lot of people said Tiny Bubble sounds like Piggies, the melody of Piggies, hmm. but it's only the first few notes, if you really think about it. Mm-hmm. The melody is, is pretty unique to itself, and it doesn't sound like something that Paul's done before for some reason. You know, I like songs like that, that sound different from anything that he's done before. So, And it's another one with an, an amazing hook to it. Hmm. And Magic I like a lot. Your Way has got that finger picking style that you're used to hearing from from paul on acoustic guitar only this time it's electric and it's got a nice country feel to it spinning on an axis is one of my favorite songs mainly because i i not only like it, it's almost kind of it's not melodic it's almost rapish in a way and i love the fact that paul is playing with his voice a lot on it he's improvising and you know singing up high and it just sounds like He's having fun in the studio, not knowing exactly what he's going to sing. He's just taking his chances, and this is what came out of it. And I like it for that See, reason. And that's, and that's what I think is part of the problem with the album, is that he was taking so many chances, and he really wasn't, I, I, I don't want to say paying attention, but he just he, that, that's what this was all about, was taking chances. I mean, like I said, he, when he went into the studio, they went in and, and just threw the songs you know, they said, here are the songs, let's do it. And without any, you know, there wasn't any advanced preparation. He said, that's the way the Beatles did it. And mm. in this particular case, I just don't think it worked. I think if they had been a little more cautious, maybe with some of these songs, maybe the album would have would have worked a little better. And also, the, if they had had a, a single, they really didn't have a single from this album. So, But if I mean, you're dealing at a time when Paul wasn't having hits anyway... And Top 40 Radio wasn't going to play. And what difference does it make? Well, it does, because of the, the singles would have possibly gotten attention. You can't say, well, you know, he, he wouldn't have gotten he wouldn't have gotten airplay because you don't know that. I mean, if the... No, if the there, there came a time when Paul stopped getting airplay on Top 40 Radio. It happens to every artist as they get older. It doesn't matter how good the songs are; they're not going to get played. But this doesn't. It doesn't have to be just top forty radio, though. It no, can be, it can be. It can be FM, and even FM didn't didn't play these songs that much because they didn't really. There wasn't anything really to push. There were. So, there are emphasis cuts that you can send to rock stations. Right. And in that case, Lonely Road would be my top choice here. But um, did he, did he do that? That's the question. No, he sent from a lover to a friend. Hmm. So. Which, I mean, wrong choice. You know, that, I think that's part of the. You know, this the, the the rationale for a lot of these things it just seems so odd to me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, from a lover to a friend. Okay, Ringo isn't just some person. So if Ringo liked it, I can see him giving that some weight. But you know, going back to that interview I did with him in, I think, 1989, where I was asking him why, for instance, something like Flying to My Home is relegated to a B-side when it's so much better than things that are on the album, like Oué Le Soleil. And he said, Mm. well, you know, the thing is, I write them, so I like them all. So what I do is I play them to my kids' friends, and I see what they like. And I, I don't know, to me, that's an abdication of an artist's editorial function. And right. so to say that, you know, the only reason that he did From a Lover to a Friend is that Ringo liked it is is, is kind of in that league, except, you know, I would give Ringo maybe, you know, greater credence than I might to Paul's kid's friends, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but See, and, I don't know if I agree with what you just said about, you know, Paul and and um, because an artist can be very close to his own music to the point where he can't judge what his best material is. He can mm-hmm. he can say what his favorite songs are. That doesn't mean the public is going to like what he likes most. You know, that's just the way it is. The way that the public feels and the way the artist feels about 
the music itself could be completely different. So sometimes he might take the professional approach of let somebody else tell him what could work or what would be the best choice as a single. But I'm saying that, you know, you reach a point with certain artists and every single veteran artist now is not going to get airplay on Top 40 Radio. They'll get some airplay, if at all, on rock stations. And we're just talking about terrestrial radio now and, you know, classic rock formats and album rock. And, um, you know, the, the amount of airplay that veteran artists get is dwindling. So I don't think that Paul should worry about all this stuff because it's out of his hands you know well he has to worry about it i mean he can't just not worry about it and that's where and that's what's going to and you know a a lot of that is going to make or break whether this new album which we assume is going to be announced any day now is going to be you know it's going to it's going to flop like a ringo album or it's going to make some noise and and again what what is considered a success now when the new album came out, it went as high as number three. Is that respectable? Mm-hmm. I think I think it was. I think that was uh, even though it, it. I mean, he was hoping for number one, and I think we all kind of were. Mm-hmm. But I th- the fact that it hit number three is, you know, is, is halfway decent. The problem is it didn't stay number three for very long. It didn't. It. I mean, he tried to. You know, he really tried to build up a lot of interest in it. He, you know, he did those mm-hmm. live live gigs in England and in in New York. Um, you know, on the street, the free mm-hmm. those freebies. Yep. Um, and he tried to. He's doing what he's doing now. And he and he, you know, remember he did the pre release kind of the drumming up of you know what he was doing or you know making people guess. So we're getting to that stage again. The question is, you know. What's going to happen from here on out? But the thing is, and we just said, and even when the show was just you and me, Steve, and we were talking about Mm -hmm. the new album, he was on every TV show. Right. The hell out of this thing. And he he probably will be again. Even still, the album didn't have staying power. And it still comes down to what happens beyond Paul's promotion. What's radio going to do with it? You know, is it going to get consistent airplay? And there's only a few formats of radio that will play a new McCartney album, no matter how good it is. It's almost like the success is already predetermined. No, I, I, it, it really comes down to what the fans are going to do. The fans need to buy the album. You know, I mean, Ringo, Ringo talks about that, you know, kind of jokes about how many people buy his album. I mean, yeah. that's what it's going to take. The fans are going to need to... Fans are going to need to buy the album, and not, and hopefully, we won't be, you know, assaulted with a number of different editions, like we were with new. I mean, we probably will be, but we probably will uh, be. this this actually raises an interesting topic, or several <laughs> interesting topics. One, mm-hmm. which I'm just going to mention in passing, is you know, Steve, when you say the fans have to buy the album, you know, increasingly. Paul is, like everybody else, working in a world where people don't buy anything. They just download it free on the Internet. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Paul may be, you know, a billionaire or whatever, but a lot of artists aren't. And, um, you know, there's, there's, I think fans of people probably have to think about that um, because I, I think that... I think that fans of any of the Beatles, really real fans, um, serious collector fans, are going to go buy it because you want it for the integrity of the collection. You want the physical thing. You know, you want to be able to hold the album cover in your hands and look at the picture. Oh, sure. Um, But, you know, not all Beatle fans are like that these days, you know. And uh, so there's that. But, But the main thing that I found interesting in your comments... Um, was the question of whether Paul McCartney can have a hit album now. And in that case, whether he has to continue to think about whether he's going to have a hit album. If he knows for a fact that the radio formats of 2018 are just not going to play his thing, in a certain way... 
that should be incredibly liberating because instead of having to come up with what he thinks or his kids friends think is a commercial sound he can go into the studio and do whatever the hell he wants and i bet if he went in and did whatever the hell he wanted what would come out would be a lot more interesting than if he went in trying to make a hit probably probably i mean look oh. at look at look at uh, electric arguments mhm yes exactly mhm okay but was that really a successful album it's a successful album as something to listen to and hear interesting stuff going on in start to finish yeah it, it was okay. also very critically successful which is something that he hasn't really i mean he's had he usually gets decent reviews usually but that album he got super reviews he got excellent reviews and critics are i you know say what you want about critics i mean watch it yeah yeah <laughs> oh, I, believe me i'm i'm in that group too you know but uh you know for critics to really like that album says a lot and it has and it, that album even though it's not an album that we talk about very often i mean that album has held up it really has because he went in and just did what he wanted to do he didn't really you know he didn't really care and and he and he did it and bingo yeah i mean he's done other he's done other experiments too the kanye west things now i wouldn't call those on the same plane as electric arguments mm -hmm. but those have their audience i mean the, it may not be the audience that you know that you and i are in but it has it has an audience i mean he's playing four or five seconds in the concert which that that surprised me when i saw that i was i was really amazed that he actually played that but well i, I still think that paul really wants his albums to sell mm -hmm. and be commercially successful well, i doesn't? think i think no i think that's how he judges a success i don't think i, I don't know if he really deep down knows what his best material is the easiest thing for him to do is take a look at what has sold and think that's what the public wants. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. this is why he'll still do Band on the Run and Live and Let Die and Jet and Maybe I'm Amazed and the classics right there. But there's so much that he's never done live from his solo career. And that's because he sticks with what he knows has sold. You know, it's one thing to play your new album and promote it. But when it comes to his catalog, he doesn't go deep. And um, aside from the Beatles stuff, which is the safe way to go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I still think that deep down, he measures his success by whether or not his latest album is doing well. And I don't think he has any clue as to how radio is, other than knowing that it helps to give interviews on radio. He doesn't know how radio is structured these days. You know, I don't think he spends time thinking about all that. And he really shouldn't have to. I mean, he's the artist. He should only care about his own work really, and have fun doing it, too. Mm -hmm. But it's people like, like us to think about these things. I remember when, when the Flowers and the Dirt remaster came out, and I thought they did such a tremendous job, and I knew that there are some radio stations that play both Paul's music and Elvis Costello's music, and you've got these gems on there that hadn't come out as demos, and nothing was done with it to promote it. Nothing. I mean... I think I have a mind for what could work on certain formats of radio. And when a new release comes out and it doesn't even get airplay that I think really deserves it, it's just a shame. I think Paul only knows he's got a new album. He's got to do interviews. The more interviews he does, the better off the sales could be. But he doesn't realize that unless there's continuous airplay over a long period of time, then his records won't have longevity. Although in this day and age, you can always question how important radio is because some people feel it's not as important as it used to be. People today can discover music through uh, file sharing or going on YouTube. They may not be hearing new releases as much through the radio as they used to, as mm -hmm. when we were growing up. You can so, go on Spotify too, play the whole thing. Mm. Yeah. How do his things do on Spotify? Do we know? No. I don't. We haven't heard, uh, they they haven't we haven't heard for a long time. I mean, I would assume that they couldn't do badly, but 
I mean, because we know the Beatles stuff does well. I mean, we've heard that before. So, um, but getting back to Driving Rain, just a, one, a few more points. I love the song about you, which we didn't even talk about. It's a really good rock song. I think it's got a nice edge to it. It's got a nice fat sound. There's something that's done there on the keyboards that I think is pretty interesting. That's also, there's no other song in Paul's catalog that sounds like that to me. I like the instrumental Heather. I mean, yeah, we have, we all know how uh, the marriage fell apart, but it's still a very pretty song and very nice lyrics, although it's only one verse. Mm -hmm. Uh, Back in the Sunshine again is, I like that, although um, Paul again is, is, filtering his voice which i'm not too crazy about your loving flame is is a good ballad i like it more now than i did when it first came out rinse the raindrops i really love because like we were talking about with john with i don't want to be a soldier it's something that's out of character it's loose it's Mm -hmm. spontaneous Mm -hmm. and i like that it's the same thing with spinning on an axis which you said steve doesn't work but I like sometimes when Paul does something spontaneous in the studio. There are some people that wish he wouldn't be so controlling and so polished. Mm-hmm. Just cut loose. It's like the people who like the Russian album, you know, for the looseness of it. Right. Yeah, it's it's tight at the same time. But, you know, there's a difference between the Russian album and Run, Devil, Run, which is very edgy but very polished. Mm-hmm. And it just sounds like so well rehearsed. But – I like when when Paul does things that's very loose, a jam like that, which doesn't happen. When does he ever do a jam on a record that's more than 10 minutes? I mean, I could think of Mumbo, which is like uh, under five minutes, Mm -hmm. but I wish I wish I'd hear more of that. That side of McCartney riding into Jaipur is nice. It's got an, an Indian feel to it every now and then. You know, he does release songs that have uh, Indian instrumentation or a feel like that like this one, for example. Mm -hmm. But overall, I like, you know, all the songs. It's just whether or not they all gel together. And I think think that's the big problem with this, with this album. I mean, I don't like all the songs like you do, but I think that's the problem that this thing just doesn't gel together. And, and like I said, my feeling is that he tried a little bit to be, to do too many things and they really didn't have a plan when they went in and that's what kind of messed this up uh, which is too bad i mean it, pro- it probably could have been a better album one thing I, I have to say i do like is the cover i love that cover picture and yeah. actually there's a if you remember i don't remember if it was on all of them but they did do a um a sleeve for it with the uh, driving usa logo uh, for the for the tour um right. but uh but uh, no, I do like that that cover photo with his hand up. I think that's kind of mysterious. But um, I mean, if I had to grade this thing, I, I I think I'd probably have to give it a I'd I'd be I'd be nice and give it a C. Uh, I think uh, this is not uh, one of his uh, crowning moments. But that's my that's my feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's about what I'd give it to. I think in a generous moment. <laughs> well, I would give it more of a B plus. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. It's like I said, I do like all the songs. Whenever I'm in the mood to hear a certain song from this, it's a good feeling when you do get to hear it. So, you know, there's one other thing that we didn't bring up, and that is just the the fact that this album actually came out a couple of weeks before George passed away. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know if the album lost steam because of it, but uh, the timing wasn't all that good. And, you know, everyone's attention really was given to George, understandably. So, um, mm-hmm. that, may, that may have figured in a little bit, too. Um, but... Yeah, but it could have figured in the opposite way, too. It could have figured in as, okay, now there are two of them gone. Um, we should focus on what the remaining ones are doing while they're still here. Uh, so that could have actually helped in a way, but doesn't seem mm-hmm. to have. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think the focus at the time had to be on George, mm-hmm. you know, as it should have been. You mm-hmm. start thinking about all that he accomplished in his lifetime, right. Beatles and Solo, and, and that's as it should be. Yeah, I'm not know? sure people are, are necessarily limited to doing only one thing you know 
Well, in in his particular case, I mean, I, it probably was somewhat of a distra- distraction because he was probably getting updates. And I know, you know, at the well, time, yeah. but at the time, you, you know, we were all we were all following, you know, you know what was happening with George too. So, mm. um, I mean, it wasn't the distraction with us, but he had a more direct content. He had more direct information, so he knew where things stood. And didn't mm-hmm. he go? Didn't he go see him? Within those last, within that last month, mm-hmm. yes, he so, did. Yeah, so. But by then the album was out. Okay. Anyway. Well, so maybe okay. You know, like if if there's something to that, then you add that to what I said at the beginning about you know it, it being a tough time for him, you know, maritally. You know, you probably also had the 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 pressure not pressure necessarily but the you know the things that come up for you if one of your friends is dying you know yeah so. right mm. yeah that's it's not that's not an easy time right but anywho okay so we um didn't all agree on everything about this album and yet managed not to have a knockdown drag out um <laughs> Wait till next week. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll see. And uh, so, thank you guys for uh, the discussion, and thank you all out there for listening. And let's give our contact information, Steve. You can contact us at uh, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail dot com. Um, we have a face. We have two, actually two Facebook pages. We have a Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans Facebook page, and we have a second Facebook page just called Things We Said Today that is linked into the Fab Four Radio dot com broadcast of the show at midnight Saturday and at noon at midnight ET Sunday. Uh, and Again, you can write to us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We're also on Twitter at things we said fab. Uh, I, oh, and you can download us at pod on Podbean. You can we have a, a streaming page on YouTube, and we're also available through numerous podcast apps. And you can get a hold of me at beatlesexaminer at gmail dot com. And I have already plugged my Beatles news and information Facebook page. Um, Back to you, Alan. Yeah, I think maybe we should make different mixes for each of these places where you can get the show and have people compare them. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we'll have limited edition mixes and mono. Mono and stereo mixes and <laughs> special Japanese edition. <laughs> right. There we go. So Ken, how do people get in touch with you? So Alan. <laughs> they can email me at every little thing at att.net, and they should always check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. I should say one thing because I'm going to be on vacation for um, close to two weeks, and on my website, as I have my weekly Beatles trivia, the trivia is going to last for a couple of weeks. It's going to run through June the 26th, and I have something called a Beatles super montage on there. It's 10 songs, Beatles or Solo. And as you hopefully know, on the trivia page, there's nine prizes that you can pick from every single week to win. If you get eight of the 10, you can win one prize. If you get nine of the 10, you can win two prizes. And if you get all 10, you can win three prizes. So it'll test your knowledge of Beatle and solo Beatle music. Just visit my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. And have fun with it. Okay, and have a great vacation, Ken. Thank you. And the best way to get in touch with me is through Facebook, either and on the Alan Cozen page or Alan Cozen Remixed. So thanks again for listening, and uh, for Ken Michaels, Steve Marinucci, and myself, and for things we said today, we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.